Hello, uh, I'm Dan Hapke, and welcome to Fast and Faster. So, Agile is what gets what teams fast, at least that's the motto that it goes by. But retrospectives, I believe, are what get us faster. And this is a retrospective on retrospectives it themselves, and uh, I'll go into a bit more detail. But first, who am I, and why am I here, and why am I talking to you? Well, I do a variety of things, and uh, to begin with, my day job, who pays me to not be at work and be here instead, I'm CTO of an organization called Adaptivist. And we, broadly speaking, help organizations develop software better. As well as that, I am part of a CTO network, help mentoring other CTOs, um, both offering peer side-to-side -side, uh, experiences, uh, so myself into the banking industry, for example, giving my consultative experience, but uh, also uh, in training up uh, people who are lead engineers uh, inside of, say, a startup and wanting to uh, figure out how this growth things works and think more businessy. I also organize DevOps both in Belgium and in the UK. I've been doing that for about 10 years and has recently spun out into DevOps for Kids where we take kids and give them a passion for creating technology, not just consuming it. Uh, occasionally, you can find me uh, um, working at roller discos at festivals, but they're community festivals. They're festivals of people who want to come together and create something interesting, not that dissimilar to Vox, where the people in the audience, yourselves, uh, are here with a hunger to learn, and here it's a, a hunger to have fun and uh, around music, uh, around presentations and stuff. But ultimately, I'm passionate about teams. And I, I have a strong belief in community and in investment in what you do and what, how you do it. So one of the things that uh, I've done for a long time is the consultative process. And the standard f four Ws, which is actually five, but the four we care about at the moment, which we, have, we apply to retrospectives will help us give us a scope about the thing that it is we're talking about and within what context we really do care about it. So what is it? Why are we doing this? Who does it apply to? And when do we go off and do it? So if we start off with what it is. So for the uh, purposes of this conversation, it's a chance to step back and reflect. A safe harbor, if you wish. It's a place where people should be able to check their differences at the door and be able to assess something without feeling like it's personally attached to them. We'll get on to why that's important later, but it being a safe harbor and a place where people can come to have a look at something is uh, quite important. But what is it we're looking at? Well, we can have a look at and use it as a, a barometer for the health of the team. And we can look at the communication that's happening within the team. The transparency, so this is usually communication externally and communication that's coming in from, uh, uh, from outside. Also the efficiency, uh, this thing that we just did, how, effective, uh, efficient, uh, uh, how effectively did we deal with it and how efficiently did we process the work that came in and how reactive were we to anything that came up during the sprint. Were there problems that we addressed? Were there outside factors? Did something unexpected like maybe S3 going down cause us some problems? Interestingly, it's also not just a team for tools, uh, a tool for teams, but it could also be used for HR. In fact, in the most uh, advanced organizations I've seen, HR have used it in order to measure success of a team and how they impact other teams. For example, in our one-to-ones, we're often asked about our personal objectives and how we've achieved learnings in these areas or how we help the organization these goals. But what about assists, where you've helped someone else and your involvement in that process has pushed them further and farther? So your 10 minutes enabled and unlocked two hours of effort of theirs, whereas if you stepped back, they would have been thrashing around and they wouldn't have progressed. Being able to unlock and figure those things out is quite hard. But it's worth pointing out that I've seen in the most advanced organizations that rewarding people for supporting others is far more beneficial. But if we start off by trying to understand a retrospective by starting with the purpose of what it is that we're doing, because ultimately it's fostering a desire for an improvement. As if you didn't care about improving, then there's no point in sitting back and figuring out how well we did, because you don't care. You're just going to do it again. And that culture of introspection and having a look back at what you've done is what exactly you're fostering. 
Hopefully, by doing this, you're increasing empowerment within the team and enabling people to challenge what they've just done and how they could have done it better. And ideally, that will also reduce frustration, going from the, isn't it horrible to work here, to how can I make this better? So we can often apply these quite easily, and it's talked about often as being a scrum and agile thing. And it happens also inside of Kanban teams and other teams that have got a unit of work and uh, at the end of it want to look back. But any team that has at least some degree of autonomy and control over what they do and how they do it, they, they can benefit from taking the same approach. I've sat in many a board meeting where we've ran a retrospective over the last quarter following the same methodology and it's opened up a lot of avenues of uh, thought that weren't, thought, uh, weren't accessible before. And the reason they weren't before is because each team member came with their idea. So, for example, finance would come and say, hey, we spent this much money, here's where we could make some cost savings. Operations said, this is the work that we were given, and here's how well we delivered it. And sales sit there and say, yeah, we sold lots of stuff, aren't we great? When you start working as a team, though, and start considering how efficient and effective has the business been at acquiring, delivering, and then co consuming, and billing for work, you start to optimize down a different pathway. And so anywhere that you have that degree of autonomy about how you work together and how you do things, um, retrospectives do apply. Duration and frequency is a hot topic. And ultimately, it boils down to, I don't care. I care you do them. And I care that there's some consistency around what you do in them and how long they take. So they shouldn't take uh, less than 15 minutes. If they are, I would argue that you're not doing the right things in them. And I'd also argue they shouldn't take more than an hour. Because if they are, then you're probably discussing the wrong things. But it depends is really the, the horrible answer to this. But you should, after running many of them, keep checking to see what you're doing in them, how effective they are and we'll give you some tips much later on how to actually do that more optimally. But the experience of the team can uh, have a major impact, because if you don't know what you're doing, you've never done these things before, it's going to be a rocky start. But just as with parenting, you have no idea what you're doing in the first three weeks. By th month three, it's like you've been doing it for the past four years. Once you've got a new team as well, every time you take someone out and put someone in, you have to reset that balance so that people won't just get the experience uh, naturally, it's almost certainly different teams have different ways of working, especially if you're following the high performance team and giving people autonomy to do things their own way. You have to learn how this team balances. But 30 minutes every other sprint isn't uncommon. But we quickly run onto the rules because everyone loves rules for retrospectives. And I have one, and it's this. This is norm curse, and there are variations, but. This is recited at the beginning of every one of our retrospectives, which is, regardless of what we discover, we understand and truly believe that everyone did the best job they could given what they knew at the time, their skills and abilities, the resources available, and the situation at hand. This is not about the blame game. That's really important. I'll say it again. It is not about the blame game. The, offers, uh, the Oscars screw up on Sunday. If any of you saw the news last night, the two accountants have been fired. Uh, it's the worst example of how to hold a retrospective of, and to learn from what you've done, because what you've learned is you screw up your debt. So I prefer this, which for um, John Aspel from uh, Etsy, he described in a much longer blog post, which I've turned into 17 words, Having blameless post-mortem process means that engineers whose actions have contributed to an accident can give a detailed account without fear of punishment or retribution. I think the uh, uh, people at PwC forgot the last bit if their intention was to ever get all the details out. It's who do I hang out for dry? It's not what you want with inside your team. That's going to create a culture of fear of screwing up. You want to, to know that everyone in your team's got your back, and we'll cover failure later. But the last thing you want to do is create an environment where people are not going to give you information for fear that it's going to come and point to them. If I did type rm-rf star, 
oops, the last thing you want that is to ha me to start cleaning my bash history and to start sweeping that under the covers because I know my job's on the line if I don't. The last thing I want to encourage my developers to do is mortgage-driven development, where they're not ben uh, they don't benefit from assisting everyone else. They benefit from being the person who has to do this. The scope of a retrospective is something that is often misunderstood. Uh, it becomes a catch-all, unfortunately, for things that we didn't do this week and things we can moan about. But here's, here's a list of things that you should or shouldn't put into your retrospective. So make sure, and I hear this every single time I sit into a retrospective with a new team, that you're not dwelling on things you can't change or improve. There's absolutely no point in moaning about the budget unless you've got the budget holder sat there and can influence them. Take offline the one-offs that they couldn't plan for and probably are unlikely to happen again. I pointed out S3 before. There are plenty of other examples. A merger or an acquisition, which means that you've now got to go into a bunch of due diligence meetings. Uh, unless you're inside of a, uh, a monolithic organization that's merging and acquiring every other week, which is unlikely, and that impacts you, don't waste your time trying to address that. It's not saying you shouldn't be prepared for them. It's not saying you shouldn't discuss how to deal with that. But your retrospective isn't the only place you should have for that. If anything, that's a red flag to suggest you should have another meeting which deals with a focus on things that are disrupting your team. Because this isn't about disruptions, not directly. The focus itself should be on the increment, but can also include the codes and features from that increment. The process that you went through in order to have to do this thing, DevOps um, drags a wonderful set of new processes into our lives as engineering teams. Uh, external factors that uh, can come and distract us. Um, the volatile CIO, uh, CEO or CIO that brings the new hottest tool of the week that says, <laughs> we're, we're now no longer building for Android. We're going to go iOS because that's where all our stuff is. No, no, China. China's got lots of people. So we should go after China this week. The, those things can be discussed because they have a major impact on your productivity and work. But... If you have no impact on those and you have no influence over them, take them offline as quickly as you can because you don't want to get hung up on the things that you can't change. Also note that the changes that are coming out, you want to posit them positively. What went well? What we could do better? What was useful? What could be more useful? Negativity breeds negativity. I think all of us have had these cathartic meetings where we moan about stuff. I mean, they're great, and you come out feeling like you've had a really good moan and have things off your chest. 90% of it's useless, though. And it's not a waste of time because it resets your emotional state, but if this is all you're spending your time doing in retrospectives, then you really are cheating yourself out of uh, potential improvements. So to pick on some things you could possibly uh, be doing wrong... Uh, I particularly like this picture. There's no after picture. I would love an after picture from the internet, but uh, ICANN has cheeseburger. It doesn't help. So this is my cardinal sin, which is why I talk about it first. As anyone who knows me knows that my personality is not quite subtle and introverted. I can dominate any meeting, conversation, or topic that I know anything about if I choose to do so. Or worse, if I don't choose to do so, and I happen to do it because I'm in that mood. I have to be aware of how I'm interacting with people and my effect on them. So avoid senior people, like myself, driving the conversation. So if you're a junior person, perhaps they're the person who should speak first. Watch out for experience being used as privilege. If, you're ever, if you've ever been a minority in a group you understand what privilege means truly. But it's really hard for most people in teams to understand what privilege means because it's afforded to them without them knowing. When you end up wielding privilege through, uh, and experience as one, it means you end up shutting the conversation down. For example, you might have heard, the, why are we doing two-week sprints? Oh, we just do it that way. I'm the, I'm the tech lead. I articulate that in a way that shuts the conversation down rather than opens it up. 
This means that I end up dismissing opinions. Just try for 10 seconds, no matter who you are. In fact, this doesn't just apply to retrospectives. It applies to everything. In fact, as a country, we went through one of the most divisive debates of well, my adult life uh, with Brexit last year. There's a political divide, and I found it really hard to understand why someone would vote the way I didn't. It was recommended to me that I spend just 10 seconds every time something that was said to me that I thought, wait a second, that's not right. Try arguing it for 10 seconds in your head. If you can't argue for it for 10 seconds and understand why they hold that position, then you probably don't understand their perspective well enough and you should do something about it. So do that by assuming that every suggestion is valid before dismissing it. That's not to say accept every suggestion. I mean, if, we, uh, if someone suggests we change the um, login page to bright pink because we want to attract girls, in my brain, <laughs> I reject that for so many different reasons, not least the let's put a bow on it theory. But I should at least try and figure out why they suggested it so I can have a better understanding of where they come from. Empathy is something we're sorely lacking and need more than most things in retrospectives. So fairly consider everything and watch out for bias, both conscious and unconscious. And your own bias will become even more irritating because your own bias will never change. You'll just notice it more. And that becomes frustrating. But that's good because that means that you can account for it. Most of us in uh, the software world have got an understanding of mathematics and understand how uh, algebra works. Think of these as unknown parts of your equation and you're fleshing it out so you have a better picture of what's actually happening. And for that, you can then actually influence yourself and others far more easily. This one is a, so, uh, a bit of an oddball, but really important too. It's really easy to set up as a team lead your retrospective to be how you do it, or how you've always done it, or how you feel comfortable. So how do we go about getting feedback, for example? Should we stick them on post-it notes? That might be fine for people who've got opinions that they're confident about, but what about weaker opinions, or people from who uh, feel that they're in a minority section and they've been judged not just for themselves, but for the minority they represent, even though they're not? What about the junior, who doesn't want to seem like they're asking a silly question? If they feel like that, you've probably got bigger problems, but you can at least start by trying to pull, it, pull information out of uh, others and making someone write something on a piece of paper and march up to a board and claim it, that's quite a big step for someone who's not confident. The same goes for emails or verbal, asking people to verbally uh, vote for something. You can use that to suppress people if you want, but be careful about doing that accidentally. Proxying is something that's really useful, but be careful about it. Proxying allows you to make your voice known uh, in an anonymous way. This is useful for contentious and hot topics that people don't feel able to talk about, uh, an edict that's come down from management that they don't feel that they can challenge, or something that they feel they would be victimized for. And again, these are all symptoms of wider problems, but they can easily drift in, for example, say a government department that has all sorts of processes that you're never going to change, that mentality can end up in the room as well, and you want to break that a bit. So a proxied opinion helps that, as does emailing, especially via proxy. But anything that falls into that bucket usually are things that need to be taken offline, but you still need to take seriously and address. Not getting stuck into a routine is really useful because that means that you don't do the same thing over and over again. And we'll cover why getting uh, stuck in a routine is bad later. But if you could change, say, the order in which people speak or the things that your, your, your areas you're covering, you'll have a chance of finding something new. And this is all about uncovering up as much information as you can, ideally information you wouldn't have otherwise got. So if you want to really reduce the value of your retrospective, you can rush them. We all get together, slap down the five things. We've done this for the last 20 sprints, and this is the 21st time. Let's just get on with it. I see that happening a lot of the time. Or worse, that people then undermine the importance of it, saying, ah, actually, I'll skip this one. 
I've got to get the the release was late going out, so there's a bug and we had to re-release. It means it's taking an hour and a half and not an hour. I'll skip this meeting. One person skips and then the second person skips and the third person skips and you have two people in the room out of your team of eight people. The challenge with that is that the, the output of that no longer has any gravity because the six people that weren't in the room don't feel that they were part of the discussion. Therefore, they don't feel part of the decision and therefore they're not going to be fighting for it. It gets worse when you have the exactly the same effect, but everyone is mandated to go along, but they bring their laptops. <laughs> and really what's happening is people are checking their phones or their laptops, and they're not engaged in the conversation either. And while they may have heard it, they didn't really hear it. It's just dress in one ear, out the other, and they struggle to catch up or feel engaged. And they don't want to fight for this thing anymore. Ultimately, you should get out as much as you put in. And if you're not, that's a measurement you want to figure out. And it's very subjective, but you can figure it out. Ultimately, I get upset. Why? I get upset because of lost opportunity. I take this into the sales world because it's nice and demonstrable. My sales guy comes to me. He comes to me really proud because he's made a sale. What makes him really upset is when you say yes to his first offer. He says, hey, I'll give you a piece of software for $10. Great. He knows he could have asked for 11, or maybe 12, or 20. Who knows? He said yes. There was no negotiation. From a sales guy's perspective, his value is determined by how much he drags in, in terms of uh, um, uh, invoices, for the thing that he's selling. So he gets upset because he thinks he could have asked more. Notably, he could have also got a higher commission. Now, what's our job? Our job as development teams is to take a set of things and get them out the door. To do, do the piece of work in the middle. If we could have developed that better, if we could have developed more, if we could have anticipated a problem, if we could have been more effective or more efficient, if there was a string of things we could do next week, but we were either too lazy, too ignorant, we suppressed the information because people didn't seem brave enough to grab the elephant in the room and say, hey, we have to deal with this. This is the thing that's slowing us down. This is how we could have been better. We should be upset because we're not better, or at least we're not as best as we could be. And the whole point of retrospectives is to continue that cycle, to look back and say, if we were doing this again and we had it all come in again, are we just going to do the same thing in the same time? Are our estimates going to be all the same? Surely the estimates should be better. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll be smaller. They should be more accurate. Because we've done it already and we know what we're doing. The same should happen with our teamwork, our processes, our understanding of how we fit into the system. So we can power up. And uh, we can do that in a few ways. And one of the first things that I try and encourage the more senior people in the room to understand and for the junior people to underpin, is that this is really about leadership. If you focus on the leadership, everything else falls into place. It's time to make yourself redundant. It's one of the reasons I get to stand on this stage. The best retrospectives, as far as I'm concerned, are that I can walk into that room and say nothing. If I have nothing to contribute, there's nothing that they missed, there's nothing that I had to teach them. My job is done, kind of. But my goal is to make myself redundant, not to be needed. My goal is to make the people who report to me do the same down the chain, which is why the person with the least to say speaks first, and the most to say speaks last, and measures themselves, because they're usually the most senior person, on how little they have to say. If I wasn't here in the room, would that still happen well? And actually, it never works perfectly out like that, but it's not supposed to. But that's my aspiration. It means that whenever I'm talking, I'm teaching. Because I could have done all this. Yes, OK, I, uh, it's paralyzed and we got some. I, but I could have done everyone's job, effectively. That's not arrogance, it's because I've been there. 
but that's not my job anymore. It's their job to do that and my job to support them in doing so. And a lot of people I come across forget that their role is to not have to do it. And it's not about, oh, I could have done that better. It's about how can I support you and empower you to do better. In fact, the most valuable people I find in the room are the youngest and most junior in the team because they're the ones that bring the new ideas. They're the ones that challenge the things that we do day in, day out, because getting work done is easy. I say easy. It's the thing that we know most how to do. Getting challenged about the thing we don't know or point out the thing that we've uh, taken for granted, that's where their value lies. So, oh, sorry. Remember, what is heard isn't always what is said. That means it doesn't matter what you say that matters. What matters is what they hear. It doesn't matter what message you're standing up there showing. Ma Some people will try and distort it willfully. Some people will try and distort it because it doesn't fit their world. Some people will reject it. So be, aw be aware of your audience and how that's uh, being adopted. This one's a hard one, diversity. And I say it's hard because we've been talking about it for so long and uh, my, my fellow white males <laughs> of heterosexual nature are sick and tired of it, frankly. And I am too, because I'm sick and tired of having to point out why it matters. I'm not talking about diversity of gender, of race, of religion. I'm talking about diversity of thought and diversity of experience and diversity of role. There is no point in having a retrospective on how a database fell apart with only DBAs when it was a software that went wrong. You need a diverse set of opinions and views in there in order to understand what went wrong. And there's no point in having a bunch of juniors because your experts are currently dealing with something else because they didn't go to the retrospective in trying to diagnose what process should we put in place so someone can't RFM minus RF uh, forward slash. What you need is a diverse set of experiences in there so that the juniors have got someone to learn from, but also that the people who are the experts don't go around creating this over-engineered architecture when the junior says, hey, do we really need the access to the database? Why don't we just ask someone else to do it? In fact, the most profound thing <laughs> that came out of a junior's mouth recently when dealing with a cons large consultancy company that uh, had taken the DevOps approach and pushed it all down to the developers was, why don't we peer review branches of our CI stuff and of our SQL as well as we do with our code. None of the engineers that have been there 12 plus years even thought of that because that's not how they went around things. But that obvious question, which is obvious when you think about it, came from a junior that said, hey, what about this? They tend to be really good at pointing out the emperor with no clothes. Um, oh, uh, if you can, rotate roles, especially you, you rarely have someone in the room that can only do one thing. Sometimes you do, but we all have diverse backgrounds. And so asking someone to, uh, who's a developer to play product owner gives them a better appreciation of what that role entails, but also brings a fresh perspective to it. I mean, don't do it every week, but it, um, it shakes things up and gives uh, you new, new perspectives. Transparency is an important one. I mentioned on my third slide. And where I'm talking about transparency is high-performing teams suck. Actually, they don't. They're really awesome. But the problem is they suck. If you take Netflix, the biggest problem that they had with uh, high-performing teams, which is mastery, autonomy, and purpose, and you give them these things, and you allow them to go off and build. They can choose their own technology stack. They can choose how they do things and build things. That's awesome, except they picked a different language. And now we've got 12 teams that have all picked different languages, and we now haven't got one developer that can move between teams, unless we retrain them. And the, your organizational knowledge now just becomes team knowledge and becomes harder to exploit. So autonomy isn't about doing whatever the hell you like. Autonomy is about being able to try something new and having the power to change something. And if it works, 
why isn't everyone else doing this? I mean, there may be good reasons not to, but if, you, if it works well for your team, if this technology stack is uh, actually really great for building a microservice, why are, why are you using Scala over there and everyone else is using uh, Clojure? Be because it was cool? <laughs> Wrong answer. So make sure you export your learnings and import better behaviors that you get from others. And try and keep consistent. Because you are supposed to be a team of teams, not just an individual set. Also make sure that you understand how you're enabling others. This is the H part R point I was talking about earlier. Autonomy doesn't mean do what you like. It means be able to justify what you do and why you're doing it different. Why are you creating a yet another key value store? Why are you storing your credentials in the same place as everyone? Why the hell are you using that encryption algorithm? I mean, there may be justifiable reasons for all of the above. However, you have to be able to justify them. Uh, uh, it's uh, adaptivist. People can do whatever the hell they want. But if it's not what everyone else does, expect me to ask you why you're doing that. And if it works well, we'll try and get everyone else to do it as well. If it doesn't work well, why are you still doing it? I mean, we do have hack days. We have uh, the ability to play with cool stuff. And actually, for stuff that's a fringe consuming service, taking email and throwing it, yeah, help. knock yourself out, use a Lambda. But let's not decide we're going to move everything over to Lambdas just because you did a cool hack day project. Make sure you're upskilling other teams as well. I'm sure we've all been in organizations where you have the A team. This, this team that's a click of people that's impenetrable, that come around and revered, they're allowed to do whatever the hell they want, and they're en enabled to do so because they solve problems. That's great. But how are they helping anyone else? I would measure them based on how they improve other teams. Not how well they deliver work. They should be multipliers. They should be multiplying the speed that everyone else delivers at because they've demonstrated they're good at it. I care less for finding a doer that's awesome than someone who's mediocre but can improve everyone else around them. Less of the rock stars and superstars. I like this one, because be prepared to break boundaries, as complacency takes many, many forms. We've all been in that relationship in our personal lives where we knew six months ago we probably should have done something about that. And yet we didn't because we're comfortable a little bit scared, maybe, of what do we do? If it's a long relationship, that might mean some physical changes, maybe some financial changes. We've all been in that same position we've worked to. And yet our friends will coach us about our personal relationships and not say, hey, that job you hate, the thing that's grinding you down, the thing you spend most of your life doing. Perhaps you should reassess what you're doing there. Especially in the world of technology, there's so much opportunity out there. It's not worth spending time not doing something you love. Most of us do this because we're comfortable. And so you want to become uncomfortable because then making a change becomes easy. When you're used to changing things, making yet another change isn't too hard. Failing is OK. In fact, I try to make failure mandatory. One of the hardest things with failure is if you don't fail, <laughs> you get used to not failing. <laughs> and then it becomes harder when it does. Amazon have already wrote uh, um, why it took them so long to recover from their S3 incident. And it had nothing to do with the policy and the procedures. It's just, it's not happened before. They weren't prepared for this. Well, they kind of were. They had policies. But how many people have got DR policies that they've not executed in the last six months? Plane uh, pilots, they constantly go through crash tests. They do it monthly. Because when you're in st under stress, your brain shuts down. You get flooded with cortisone through your brain. And you can only do what you know. Apply that to driving. Your car starts to skid. You don't have time to think, well, my rear wheels are going left. I turn the wheel to the right. Do I or don't I push the brake? You do it or you don't. And the same happens when you're failing. If you're not prepared for failure, then when it hits you, you'll panic. And so make sure that you keep the impact of failure small and fail often. 
And if you're not failing at all, and this isn't just about technology, I'm not suggesting you take your website down every minute. I'm suggesting you seek for ways to improve, because if you're not making those changes, if you're not used to the change of happening, of unexpected situations coming up, if you're not looking for that, you become comfortable. And we are creatures of comfort. I like this bit, because <laughs> this goes all the way down for anyone who uh, knows the Inception photo. Hold retrospectives on the retrospectives, this sort of thing. But this is more me telling you about stuff. This retrospective we spent for um, 30 minutes, just leave five minutes at the end. Was there anything we didn't cover, didn't get around to? Did this work for everyone? Did anyone have something to say but didn't? I mean, you have to have a super comfortable environment in order to be able to ask that question, but we do, uh, we have and we do. And any time there is a, yes, I didn't get to talk about this and I think that was important, red flag goes down and we make sure we change that. So just take a short amount of time and figure out, could you have done the improvement process itself better? You can keep that all the way down if you want. But we're coming to the end now. And I get asked this often. Is, uh, people keep quoting Voltaire at me, who said, perfect is the enemy of good. Well, I think that means you settle for what you can get, and you should be continually striving for more. So I think good enough is the enemy when pursuing perfection, because you want to constantly be trying to be better, even if you can't be. That's what this time's for. So my real question is, how can your sprint be better? Thank you. I think we've got a minute or two for questions, if anyone has any. Uh, there's a microphone. They want you to speak into it. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts around if you have teams that have kind of um, set up already how they want to run things or do retrospectives, but they then have to work more closely, how you can kind of coordinate that and have teams doing things their own way, but also still like filtering up and have the upper levels knowing what everyone's doing. So part of that's communication is ultimately what that boils down to. Uh, but you can also do transplantation if that works for you. Uh, the two ways I see happen most, transplantation is one people hear least about, communication kind of speaks for itself, taking someone from the team and swapping them out somewhere else. It requires teams to work in safety. Well, rather than me as an engineer coming in and saying, hey, your retrospective is bad, you should do these five things, I'm a developer. I can sit and work with you. I'll pair with you for this next sprint. And I'll be seconded over and Every time you start to write code without a test, I'll slap your hands in. Off we go, and that, that, that transference of knowledge, and oh, that's an interesting way of doing it, to which the response is, how else do you do it? And it opens up that conversation. It becomes a more personal and prolonged thing. And if you're an engineer, you still get the value of having an extra engineer, too. And so it's not like you're losing anything, but you do need to be able to mix people up. Uh, communication is obviously on blogs or communicating or brown bags. There's uh, many ways that you can shout about, this is the thing that we're doing. Um, one of our rules is if you're doing anything that's not what people would expect, and the unwritten rules as well as written ones, but we're now going to try out this library instead of Hibernate. And we're doing it because Hibernate doesn't give us this thing. You run it as an experiment. So we have a hypothesis, and we have a reason, and here's the experiment, and we have an end date. And then we say, hey, it's working, so we think everyone else should do that who has a similar set of requirements. Or we say, didn't work, we're going to try something different. But communication and... Uh, being able to be justify what you're doing and why you're doing it, where it is different, uh, is always what we try and underpin. Any other questions? So I'll end on the DevOps movement. So DevOps uh, is continually talked about as CALMS. Uh, has anyone heard the acronym CALMS? It has some. It gets talked about lots in blog posts, but no one really understands it. So it means that DevOps is, uh, has got five pillars, CALM, C-A-L-M-S, which is culture, lean, automation, metrics, and sharing. Now, automation through to sharing 
become obvious. I mean, there's, uh, you've got platforms for monitoring. Uh, sharing becomes writing blog posts and uh, uh, pushing your data out and making open data standards. Uh, automation, Puppet, Chef, Salt, Ansible. Uh, the real hard part is culture. And this is a start down that path. So if you're wanting to influence culture with inside your organization, if you're wanting to make things better, or even just make things different, because change is the thing that everyone else does, right? <laughs> start with your own team and start small. Start with a retrospective and see where you go. Thank you. <laughs>